Well, good evening once again. Having passed through the waters of the book of Daniel, I decided we would embark on some even deeper waters and with a little bit of suggestion from Linda and uh, try our hand at some apologetic teaching. And uh, so starting tonight and the next three weeks, the thrust of the teaching is apologetics. And I'll be defining that and explaining exactly what that word means here shortly. Uh, it's probably a word that uh, maybe you've never heard before, but most certainly probably a word you never use. Um, so we need to get our bearings and uh, get an understanding of what we mean by apologetics. And then we will be moving further down the road of apologetics this night, uh, specifically in the area of arguments for the existence of God. And uh, we're going to talk about four of those specifically this evening. So, so with that, let's pray, and uh, we'll jump into things. Father, we thank you that you are the God who establishes kings. You're the God who lays low kings and kingdoms. God, you're the one who imparts wisdom. You're the one who gives understanding and knowledge. And Father, we know that your word says in James that if any of us lacks wisdom, all we need to do is merely ask of the Father who gives generously and without reproach. And that if we believe without wavering, Father, we can expect to receive from you. And so Father, this evening as we consider the defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has been handed down to the saints once for all, God, we ask you to impart wisdom to us, and especially within the discipline of apologetics. Father, help us to be better evangelistic people, as well as people who will boldly defend the truth that you have given to us. And so, Father, to that end, we ask that you'd help us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So you should have had an outline when you came in. It's a front and back, and there's only a few, uh, few blanks to fill out uh, versus uh, some of the extravagant fill-in-the-blanks that I gave you through the book of Daniel. And I'm not apologizing for that, but I am smiling a little bit about that. Um, so this evening, we're going to jump into arguments for the existence of God, and we want to start off with a very... me, Alex. And this important question, we could arguably say, is also the biggest of all big questions. So have you ever pondered big questions, big issues? Well, this is maybe the biggest of all big questions that we could ask as human beings. And that question is just simply this, how can we know that God exists? again. Same thing, huh? Well, we'll see what happens. I might switch to uh, a microphone if, or a different one if we uh, continue to have problems. So the question before us is, how can we know that God exists? So this is open for answers from you. Before I give you my answer this evening, which is going to be quite in-depth, and I hope you're ready to have your brains hurt a little bit when you leave this evening, and uh, once again, you can just thank Linda for this at the end of the night. So, uh, <laughs> But if I were to ask you, as I am asking you, how can you know that God exists, what would you say? What's that? You believe He does, okay? Okay. Okay. So because there is a creation, therefore we know that he exists. Okay, very good. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Anybody else? Brad? Okay. Yeah, okay, that's good too. Very good. Yeah, Joe? Because he told us he does. Because he told us he does. Okay, that's good. Well, these are all very, very good, and we're going to talk about all these this evening so far. But uh, anybody else? The Bible, says so. the Bible says so. All right, so upon that answer, we're going to move forward, right? Because that is often the answer that you get, especially amongst Christians. When you ask them this question, well, how do you know that God exists? Well, this book tells me that he exists, right? And that is, um, that is certainly one of the best answers out there. One of the possible answers, obviously, the Bible says so. But for the extreme skeptic, the person who just does not believe that God exists, whether you want to label them unbeliever or maybe use more strong uh, language like atheist, but the extreme skeptic may not be impressed with that answer. And they may even argue that this is a circular argument. For example, this is what they could say. Well, that's just a circular argument. The, how do you know that God exists because the Bible says so? Well, follow the reasoning here. How can we know God exists? Response, the Bible says so. So question, why should I believe what the Bible says? Response, because God wrote it. Question, but how do I know that God exists? And we start back up at the beginning again, because the Bible says so. And so we have this circular argument that never goes anywhere. Now, by all rights, the Bible is the right answer, right? Bill, you have the right answer. And I'm going to challenge you guys a little bit this evening, right? Because um, we need to understand how the world is thinking a little bit. We need to get inside their head a little bit. And this is an objection that the, that the world has against the Christian who says, I know God exists because this book says he exists. But they're thinking, well, that doesn't prove anything. That's just a circular argument. So therefore... We ask the question further, are there other ways in which we can reasonably and effectively answer the question, how do we know that God exists? And you have all presented some other very good answers to this end. But we want to ask the question, apart from the Bible, are there other ways that we can answer this question? So, my proposition for us tonight and in the next four weeks, is that yes, there are other ways to adequately and effectively and very reasonably answer this question. And so how? The answer is through the means of apologetics. And I'm sorry for that. I don't know why it's doing that. But So, but before we get to apologetics, we need to talk about this word epistemology. So I'm going to throw some big words at you tonight. I'm going to try to define them along the way. And uh, if I miss one, raise your hand. If you have questions uh, to, uh, for further definition, please let me know. I don't want to lose anybody. But we need to talk about this idea of epistemology before we can talk about apologetics, okay? So epistemology, let's uh, unpackage this by asking another very big question. And that question is this. How can we know things, anything at all? How can we know anything? Right? This is a great question. For example, how can you know that you are sitting in a pew in a church in Jefferson, Iowa in the evening in the year 2021 surrounded by other people who are also being asked the question, how can you know these things? Can you guys get me that lapel mic, please? So, we're asking this question, because I'm trying not to be distracted by...
All right. Can you hear me now? All right. Okay. So, a little bit hot. The second big question, how do we know things at all, right? So the first question is, how do we know that God exists? Um, I am going to argue that yes, Scripture, but beyond Scripture, if we're answering the world and the extreme skeptic who says, well, I believe that that is just a circular argument, do you have anything else for me? Well, my contention is that yes, we do have other things for the extreme skeptic, and that is in the field of apologetics, but in order to explain apologetics, I need to first explain epistemology. And this brings up the question of, how can we know things? Anything at all. My example is, how can you know that you are sitting in a pew in a church in Jefferson, Iowa, in the evening, in the year 2021, surrounded by other people who are also being asked the question, how can you know these things? Any takers? How can you know that you're sitting where you're sitting at this point in time, at this location in space? Logic. Expound on that. Okay. Okay. Gary? Yeah. So because you think you're sitting in that pew, therefore you must be sitting in the pew. Like what, what other kinds of witnesses? You're, I think you're on the right track. Okay. Okay, so Lodine said you're here, therefore you must be here. <laughs> well, kind of like the, the disciples of Christ that were with him, uh -huh. witnessed him being there. Okay. Yeah? Anybody else? Janet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Before your heads break, let's. <laughs> the philosophical answer or approach to this question is what is called the field of study of epistemology. Epistemology, by definition, is the study of knowledge and justified belief. It's the study of how do we know what we know, and how do we know that we know that we know. It's the study of knowledge, essentially. Just leave it at that, and we'll go a little bit further here. But as it says here, it is the study of how we know things, and also the study of how do we know that we know things. So it's the study of knowledge and the, the study of justified belief. So justified in the sense that it is proven. There's evidence for it. Somebody said belief. I believe I'm here in this room, therefore it must be true. Belief in and of itself isn't adequate for you to know that you are sitting in this pew. And uh, let me explain. So if we ask the question further, what is knowledge... Epistemology defines knowledge as justified, true belief. All three components are very much necessary to explaining what we mean by knowledge. Justified, true belief. Okay? So, let me give you an illustration, see if I can explain what, what we mean by this word knowledge and its definition. Imagine a car with a broken gas gauge, right? So, I have a car with a broken gas gauge. As I get into my car to drive to church, I have a belief that there is gas in the tank. But, because the gauge is broken, my belief is merely belief and not actual knowledge. 
I don't know if there's truly gas in the tank. I just merely believe there is. Why do I believe? Well, I have no reason to believe. I just believe it to be so. This is not knowledge. Okay? Let's consider scenario number two. I have a car with a broken gas gauge, and I have a belief that there is gas in the tank, just like scenario one. But furthermore, that belief is based on the fact that my wife put gas in it this afternoon. <laughs> I'm just going to take her at face value. I trust my wife. She doesn't lie to me, okay? I'm just, I'm just going to believe it. Uh, now, whether this would actually happen or not is a whole nother <laughs> debate, but, um, but this is scenario number two. I have a car with a broken gas gauge. I have a belief, though, that there is gas in the tank. Furthermore, this belief is undergirded by the fact that my wife put gas in it earlier this afternoon. But neither is this, uh, neither does this fall under the definition of what is true knowledge. According to epistemology's definition of knowledge, this still does not qualify as real knowledge that there is gas in the tank. And why is that? Right. Right. <laughs> or what if she put gas in the tank in Kansas City and then drove home and now the gas is gone? Or what if there's a hole in the gas tank? Obviously, if the gas gauge isn't working, it's probably an older vehicle and it might have a hole in the tank, right? Or what if my neighbor snuck over and siphoned out all the gas and stole it? People still do that anymore, I don't know. It seemed to be a big thing years ago. But. So having belief and having a true fact regarding the situation is not enough to qualify as the true definition of what is, is knowledge. Okay? So consider the third scenario. I have a car with a broken gas gauge. I have a belief that there is gas in the tank. I have a belief. I have a true reality that my wife put gas in it. It is true. She put gas in it this afternoon. But thirdly, I have also taken steps necessary to gather evidence to prove whether it is true or not. Right? I, I, I took a stick and I shoved it down the, the filler spout and it came out and it was wet. So I have proven, I have evidence, I have justification that my belief that there's gas in the tank, as well as my, my wife's true report that she put gas in the tank, along with that evidence, therefore now I have knowledge. There is gas in the tank, I can get in the car and drive to church safely. So, as we ask the question, how do you know that you're sitting in the pew next to you, or sitting in the pew in Iowa, and there's people sitting next to you? Well, if we just say, I believe it, According to epistemology's definition of knowledge, we do not have knowledge that that is true. We can have somebody sitting next to us who says, I bear witness that you're sitting in that pew right there. But that in and of itself is still not sufficient. We have to take it one step further and have justification. We need to have evidence for it. Okay, which brings us to the next step. Once again, there's our definition of knowledge, what is uh, what is knowledge? Justified, true belief. All three components are necessary. So furthermore, how do we get evidence? How do we justify it? Well, within the study of epistemology, there are, um, there, there's two that we're going to talk about this evening. There's two approaches for obtaining knowledge uh, that's verifiable, that is, uh, gives us evidence and proof. The first one is called rationalism. And the next one is called empiricism. We'll define these here in a moment. Um, you may have heard these terms. Um, uh, both of them are, uh, these kind of tend to work against each other a lot of times. A lot of times people fall into one camp or the other. Either they are a rationalist or they are an empiricist. So let me, uh, maybe let me define these and maybe you'll understand and uh, recognize them. For rationalism, we find that knowledge is gained through reason and logic, right? So, Brad, you were on the right path there when you said, well, logic tells me I'm sitting in this pew. Um, 
I was trying to get you to go a little bit further down the road, but uh, that's okay. But, but rationalism says that we can gain knowledge that we are sitting in this pew in Jefferson, Iowa on Wednesday evening next to this group of people, uh, and we gain that knowledge through reason and through logic, just rational thinking, right? I can go A equals B, and A and B equals C, and so therefore I know, right? In terms of Star Trek, this might help you, think of Mr. Spock. Always the rationalist, right? Always down to the nitty-gritty of the science and the math of things, and therefore it, this is true, because I have done the rational, reasonable, uh, logic, uh, mathematical approach, and uh, therefore this is how I know what I know. On the other hand, we have empiricism, whereby knowledge is gained through experience and the five senses, right? And so, um, so, well, how do I know that I'm sitting in a pew in Jefferson, Iowa on Wednesday evening? Well, I can look out the window and know that it's dark outside, so it must be either night or morning. It's not daytime. We know that much. Um, I can smell. I can, I can see. Uh, I can hear. Those, those things are informing our knowledge, and that is called the approach of empiricism. And again, in terms of Star Trek, think Dr. McCoy, right? He, he trusts his senses. I, will not, I don't want to go out into space, Captain Kirk, because what if a little hole happened to appear in the glass, and all of a sudden we get sucked out into, into the vacuum of space, and, and it's, it's always a very emotionally um, driven, experience-driven uh, approach to knowledge, whereas Mr. Spock is always very rational, he's always very logical, very reasonable, right? And both of these are good, but like I said, a lot of times people fall into one camp or the other. But what we'll find tonight is that when we're talking about matters of the existence of God, because we recognize that God created everything, we're not there yet, but we know that because, you know, we're, we're the church, we know that. So therefore, we want to take everything available to us and bring it into conformity of the knowledge of God so that we can know God, if that makes sense. So empiricism is important, rationalism is also important, and uh, we're going to bring all of that together under the banner of apologetics. Okay, so... I've kind of already just explained that, but let me go through it a little bit clearer. So, why does epistemology and this definition of knowledge matter when we are approaching the question of how can we know God exists? Answer, because epistemology says we can have real knowledge, which is justified true belief, gained through the means of rationalism and empiricism, whereby we can confidently say that, yes, we can know that God exists. Right, so everything we've said really culminates into this point right here. That how can we know that God exists? Yes, we can know. And how can we know through very, um, very um, tangible um, gaining of knowledge, empiricism, rationalism. And we can bring those into conformity of what we see and experience in the world around us to be able to confidently say we can know that God exists, Okay. So therefore, back to Bill's statement earlier about uh, how do we know God exists? Well, because the Bible says so. Therefore, we know that God exists because the Bible says so. Absolutely. That is a right answer. That is, um, that is a core pillar of how we know that God exists. Um, circular reasoning or not, um, that is an established fact, and that is how God has designed it. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple of weeks, Okay. But uh, I don't want you to think that all of a sudden pastor has given up on the Bible because he hasn't, okay? But what I'm trying to maybe convey to you is a little bit of how the world is perceiving things. They could care less that this book says that God exists. They want more information. Is the church able to give them more information? Absolutely, yes. So, that's the second statement here. We are able to know through other credible means whereby we end up with a cord of three strands which is not easily broken, right? So Ecclesiastes says this, if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. But a cord of three stands, strands is not quickly or easily torn apart. And so the interesting thing 
we could stand firm under the single pillar that we know God exists because the Bible says so. And that would be sufficient. It'd be more than sufficient. But what happens when we start adding other um, elements of knowledge of God or approaches to the knowledge of God, maybe I should say, well, all of a sudden we end up with this scenario here, a cord of multiple strands. But all of a sudden our argument for the existence of God gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It's kind of the idea, so when I was in construction, you know, we would work on scaffoldings a lot, and a lot of times if we got over three sections high, then we would have to put outriggers at the bottom to stabilize it. So what we're doing this evening with apologetics is kind of that same idea, that we can build our tower scaffold with the Bible, no problem. But when we introduce apologetic principles, all of a sudden we're putting outriggers at the bottom that is going to stabilize our structure even more. So those two illustrations, uh, a rope of many strands as well as the tower scaffold, okay? So this, once again, comes together in the specialized field of apologetics. So we'll pause there. Any thoughts or questions? Gary. I think that what you'll see is that it's both and. That, that this will help the, un, the believer as well as the unbeliever. Um, you, you might not see it until the end of class tonight, but this will encourage and strengthen your personal faith as well as your ability to evangelize and argue for the gospel message of Jesus Christ to the unbeliever. It's both and. And... Essentially what we are doing tonight is making an argument, just a plain, generalized, four-point argument that God exists. We're not going any further than that by saying God exists in three persons, uh, one essence as the Trinity. That'll be next week. We're not saying necessarily that God exists um, as, as what is revealed in Scripture. That'll be when we get to the Hebrew and Greek text, uh, text in, in, a, in a few more weeks. Um, we're just simply giving the blanket idea and evidence for God exists. Okay, so don't make it any more complicated than that this evening. Okay, and there's going to be four arguments of how we can know that God indeed exists. And I believe that it will, maybe primarily it is for the unbeliever, um, these arguments. Um, you know, the atheist who says God doesn't exist. But I think it has an effect also in the life of the believer and that it shores up our faith as well. And I think you'll see that here in a moment. Any other thoughts, questions? Brad? Um, apologetics is, is defending of the faith. So, you know, I mean, it's just, we, we need it because the world wants to argue with apologetics. Yeah. When, especially when it comes to God. Sure. They want to just argue, well, how do you know that there's God? How yeah. do you know that there's yeah. that book was written how many years ago? Who wrote it? Yeah, absolutely, and that carries us into our next point. So if there aren't any other questions, we'll, we'll move on, because that's, you're exactly right. Okay, so what is apologetics? Let's, let's define it. What are we talking about when we use this strange word, apologetics? What is it? Apologetics, by definition, is the acquisition, the acquiring, the gaining of knowledge of God and the act of defending that knowledge once we have it. So there's kind of a twofold thrust here that uh, apologetics, at least in its modern form, um, is, is the approach to gaining knowledge of God, but also at the same time, it is um, the discipline of standing firm and defending what we indeed know about God. So there's kind of a twofold thrust here, okay? 
Furthermore, where did the idea for apologetics come from, right? Is this something that was uh, invented at uh, Harvard University or something or Cambridge or something? Where did the idea, this technical term apologetics, come from? Well, it came from Scripture. Apologetics is a biblical word with a biblical concept originating specifically from the New Testament. This is a very biblical idea and a word that is used in the New Testament often. And so maybe you're thinking, well, I've read the New Testament quite a bit, and I've never seen this word in there before. Well, you'd be right unless you were reading it in the Greek New Testament because this is originally a Greek word. It comes from the Greek word apologia. There you see it in English, the transliteration in parentheses. You see it in Greek itself. It is a noun, and it means defense. It just simply means defense. Or further, it can mean the act of making a defense. But really, if you just remember that word defense or defend, you're going to get basically the, the, uh, the gist of what this word means. Okay, So we see it in Scripture uh, often. Scripture explains apologetics further in the sense that it is, first of all, a defense of the gospel which points to the hope of Christ. So it isn't just merely the ability to argue truth. I mean, it is certainly that, but there's also a, a, almost an evangelistic agenda to it all, right? Because we as the church don't want to be right just for the sake of being right. We want to be right to the glory of God for the, for the, for the salvation of people, right? The transformation of people's lives. That's why we want to be right. That's why we stand on truth. So we can glorify God and so that we can see um, lives change, believers and unbelievers. Right? So there's, there's this sense that um, apologetics is a defense, absolutely, but it's not just merely an argument for defense, even when the world wants to argue with us um, violently at times. But there is a thrust within our defense that it's a picture of hope. And so we get this from 1 Peter 3.15. Peter says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense, a polygia, to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, right? So it needs to be sprinkled with uh, Holy Spirit fruit, right? So, um, and this is uh, typically people who really, really love apologetics miss that last phrase, yet with gentleness and respect or reverence, depending on your translation. We just want to argue and we just want to be right. And we want people to bow down to know that we're right. You know what I mean? But that's not the agenda of the church, is it? We are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all that Christ has taught us recognizing that Christ will be with us even to the end of the age, right? So there's an evangelistic uh, vein to it all. The yes, we stand firm, and we're going to be able to defend it clearly, accurately, pointedly even. Um, but there's a goal, and that would be conversion, okay? Furthermore, we could say, regarding apologetics, that it is a testimony of the gospel through personal witness, right? So... Have you ever shared your personal testimony with anybody before? Then you are doing the act of apologetics, according to Scripture. I'll show you the, the verse here in a minute. But it is a testimony of the truth of Scripture, and, uh, and that through personal witness or personal testimony. We see this in Acts 22. Remember, Paul was in a lot of trouble towards the end of Acts. You know, he just seemed to go from one prison to another and from one... Uh, you know, one shackle to another, I guess, you know. And, and uh, Acts 22, he finds himself in a, in a courtroom setting of sorts. And, uh, and he says this, he says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, my apologia, which I now offer to you. In the rest of chapter 22, Paul goes through the whole process of his testimony of transformation in Christ. What happened to him on the road to Damascus and, and how he was converted. And so we find here that Paul is um, essentially doing apologetics to this room of Jewish skeptics, and he is just simply sharing his testimony of what God did in his life. So personal testimony. I think 
maybe Brad, you mentioned that earlier, that, that uh, apologetics uh, is that, and you're absolutely right. Acts 22.1 would be a good example of that. Thirdly, apologetics, what is it? It is also a proving of the gospel as a church-wide experience, right? So a lot of times with apologetics, um, there is this preconceived notion that people who do, do apologetics are probably theologians, they're probably scholars, they're probably very knowledgeable, and, uh, and we'll just let apologetics be their, their problem in a sense, Right? But what we find in Scripture is that Paul had this expectation of the church that it would be a church-wide experience. This isn't just for the really smart people. If you have a testimony in Jesus Christ, then you can do apologetics. right? If you know what this book says, you can do apologetics. Um, furthermore, we're going to take it into a philosophical avenue this evening. And so if you have philosophical understanding of things, you can do apologetics. But the expectation from Paul was that the entire church would be proving the gospel and that it would be uh, a church-wide experience to the world. Okay? So here's where we get that from, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, Philippians, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense, apologia, and in the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. Right? So it's this, the Philippians had this testimony that um, even in the very pagan society that they were in, they were not cowed into the corner and just merely let Paul do all the work of making the defense. It was a church-wide experience. As he says here, you all are partakers of this grace with me. I think he's talking more than just the grace of Christ and the testimony of Christ, but there's, he's using this very word, apologia, defense, and the confirmation of the gospel, the proving of the gospel to the world out there. Okay? Furthermore, I want to say this one last thing, and then we'll get into our, our four arguments. The essence of apologetics is captured in the call to contend earnestly. Now, contend earnestly is also one word in Greek, but it is not the Greek word apologia. Um, but we do find it's that same idea. It's that same, uh, it's that sta same flavor um, that we're going to defend and testify and prove. We're going to contend, and we're going to contend very earnestly about it and for it. And we get this from Jude, verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation... I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. So it's the same idea, it's a different word, but it's the same concept, it's the same essence of apologetics. Making a defense by contending earnestly, standing firm, and, uh, and uh, letting the world know what is truth. So... The field of apologetics covers a broad field of study. Uh, at some points, it's very specialized. Um, there's specialized points of apologetics that merely deals with cults, right? We're going to defend the Christian faith to the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and whatever cults are out there by the dozens and millions, uh, hundreds anyway. Um, but at the same time, it's also very broad in the sense that if you have a testimony in Jesus Christ and you tell your neighbor about it, you're doing apologetics. Okay, so it's really, it's a broad field of study. But our class tonight and for the next three weeks will discuss four areas. First of all, this evening, arguments for the existence of God. So we've already talked about that a little bit more, uh, or a little bit earlier, but we're going to get into that a little bit further. Next week, we're going to be talking about the Trinitarian God. The third week, we're going to be talking about the special revelation of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And then the fourth week, the special revelation of the Greek Scriptures. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's all I have planned for this class so far. Um, more than likely, after the first of the year, we'll start a study through the life of David. But uh, we'll let the Lord lead us in that, if that's okay with you. Who knows, maybe we'll do this for the next year, Lodine. I don't know, but... That's not my plan at this point in time, okay? But uh, God can always change my plans. I give him permission to do that. <laughs> so this week, arguments for the existence of God, and we're going to cover four arguments 
The first one being evidence from being, and in parentheses here, I gave the, the technical term for it, which is the ontological argument. Um, ontological, or the word ontology, just simply means being. Being and becoming. So the first one is we're going to look at evidence from being. Secondly, we're going to look at evidence from cause. This is oftentimes referred to as the cosmological argument. It's easy to remember, cause, cosmological cause, kind of draw the connection there. Thirdly, the evidence from design, which is the teleological argument. And the fourth one, which uh, has already been mentioned this evening, evidence from ethics or from morality, the moral argument. Um, so those are the four that we're going to cover in the next uh, 25 minutes. <laughs> And I was warned we need to be out of here on time because the kids have Christmas practice this evening. So, so let's, uh, let's jump into first one, which is the evidence from being or the ontological argument. And uh, let me see if I can, uh, first of all, give you a little bit of history and then we'll talk about what exactly it is. So this argument, the evidence from being, originally developed by Anselm of Canterbury uh, in 1077 in his book, Proslogion. So you may, um, you may hear of this sometimes referred to as the Anselm argument. Uh, if you get a chance to read this in its original context, um, it's a tough read, but I encourage you to it, it be worth the time if you were able to do that. Um, but also sometimes, as I already mentioned, the more technical term for this is the ontological argument. Okay? So by definition, this is what this, uh, what this argument is is that if God is the greatest conceivable being, and that's an important phrase, those three words, greatest conceivable being, if God is the greatest conceivable being, he must exist. And his existence must be independent of everything else, meaning that it is not dependent on other things. Okay? Let me chew this into bite-sized chunks here for you and... Uh, See if you can swallow. <laughs> Anselm's argument has two thrusts of reasoning. I feel like, like the, uh, uh, the mother bird, you know, who, anyway, that's a bad illustration. I don't know why that, anyway, okay, Anselm's, where did that come from? Uh, Anselm's argument has two thrusts of reasoning, okay? So if God is the greatest conceivable being, he must exist. That's the first thrust of his argument. The second thrust of his argument is that his existence must be necessary, and I'm using the word necessary in the philosophical meaning of the definition of independent, and therefore is not contingent, which also means dependent. So his, we could say it uh, probably more simply, his existence must be independent and not dependent. Okay, let me unpackage those further. The first thrust, let's just take these one at a time. The first thrust is that if God is the greatest conceivable being, he must exist. Okay, let's just take that first of all. And here's what Anselm argued. He argued that everybody has some concept of God. Right, and this is the argument that uh, Ecclesiastes made that eternity is written in the heart of every man. Uh, it's the argument that Billy Graham used all the time. Uh, everybody has a God-shaped hole in their heart that can only be filled by God. You know, it's, that, it's, that same, it's the same uh, reasoning here, that everybody has a concept of God. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that would be a great place um, uh, for evidence as well, is Romans chapter 1, right? Verse 19. So, right, so that it's at some level, at some, you know, it might be different in different people, but in everybody, there is a fundamental understanding of some concept of God, a creator, okay? So now let's take this further, follow Anselm's argument here. So suppose we were to consider God in our minds as the greatest conceivable being, right? So we're just, you know, we don't know what God is, but we do have a concept that God is there in some form, 
We may not even use the word God. We may call him maker or creator or higher power. Um, but we understand that. And so we're going to form in our mind that based upon this fundamental understanding that there is a higher power, we're going to um, understand him as the greatest conceivable being that we can conceive of. Okay? And so with that, what qualities would the greatest conceivable being possess? Right? If you can just put it in your brains for a moment and try to think, okay, what is the greatest conceivable being? What would that look like? What attributes would he possess? What would those things be? Well, we could probably say such things as, well, he's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's eternal. Uh, he's unchanging. Um, you know, we could say things like that, right, as we're trying to put together maybe a list of, of, of the attributes of the greatest conceivable being that we can imagine, right? And suppose further that in our conceptions of the greatest conceivable being, we finally narrow it down to basically two candidates, that there's two possibilities of what this greatest conceivable being could be. Okay, we narrow it down to two. These candidates possess identical qualities in every single way except for one. Candidate A exists, has being, ontology, whereas candidate B does not exist, does not have being, does not have ontology. He's just on my piece of paper here where I kind of wrote down some thoughts of what he would look like. He doesn't really exist. He's just, um, you know, he might be a, a character in a movie. He might be a fictional character in a book. But he's just, a, he's just a concept. Whereas candidate A actually does exist. So the question is, which one of those, candidate A or candidate B, is actually the greatest conceivable being? A. Why is that? Because he actually exists. Right? He's not just a concept, but he literally actually is the greatest conceivable being, and he is in existence. He has ontology. He has being. Okay? And that's what Anselm argued. Candidate A would have to be the greatest conceivable being because he possesses all of the divine attributes, plus he also actually exists in reality. Whereas the other candidate was just a concept. Okay? That's really basically the, the argument. But there's a second thrust to the argument which follows necessarily. So the second thrust says this. That if God is the greatest conceivable being, his existence must be necessary. Meaning that it is independent and not contingent. Meaning dependent means that um, his existence, um, it, it doesn't require anything for him to exist, right? Whereas you think about us um, as humans, as creatures, well, our existence is not independent as much as we might like to think it is, but it's very much dependent. We depend on a lot of things, uh, namely the... Uh, the resourcing of God to feed us and clothe us and water us and give us breath in our lungs. We are very dependent. Our existence is very much dependent. Whereas Anselm is arguing God is independent. He doesn't rely on anything for his existence. He is self-existent. Um, Exodus chapter 3, Moses and the burning bush. Um, who am I talking to here? <laughs> I am who I am. Remove the shoes from your feet. I am the eternally self-existent God, Yahweh. Okay, so that's kind of what we're talking about here. So, if God is the greatest conceivable being, his existence must be independent. It's not dependent on his creation. Now, you get into some weird philosophy, you get into some pagan religions, cults, and they will say that, that I shouldn't even go here, God's, um, that God and creation, that they are dependent on one another. Right, that God gets his being from the earth, and God gives his being to the earth. And there's just this cohabitation. 
But that's not the God of Scripture, and it's certainly not the God that we're talking about here. We are talking about the God who is independent of anything. And we would know that. Why? Because he existed before anything else existed. Just simple answer there. But um, anyway, I'm going way off on a rabbit trail there. But Anselm's argument further goes, if God is the greatest conceivable being, but yet is dependent on another being or another cause for his existence, then therefore he would not be the greatest conceivable being, right? That other being would be the greatest conceivable being. So it's just a, it's a simple matter of, of logic and ration there. Therefore, God not only exists, but his existence is independent of any and all outside forces. So, how do we know that God exists? Well, Anselm says, first of all, everybody has some concept of God. And when we try to form that concept of God, we would be forming the greatest conceivable being. And the greatest conceivable being, which is God, has necessary existence. And that's his argument, and that's, his, uh, that's the argument of the ontological evidence. Chew on that. I know that's, uh, especially this is the first time you're hearing it, that is very complicated. So let's go into the second one, which is even more complicated. Which is, and then it gets easier, okay? So hang with me, right? Um, the second argument is the evidence from cause, or the cosmological argument, okay? Okay? Once again, a little bit of history. Um, this is old. All four of these arguments are very, very old arguments. Um, many of them going clear back to Greek philosophy uh, that the Christian uh, theologians modified and brought into Christianity and, and, uh, and uh, are, are very useful to us. But they're, but they're very ancient arguments. This one specifically uh, goes back to the time of Plato and Aristotle. And uh, more recently, as far as the Middle Ages, uh, if you call that recent, uh, was made famous by Thomas Aquinas, which is probably the smartest man who ever lived. That's just all I can say about that guy. Um, brilliant, brilliant genius. Um, so, definition, what does this mean? The cosmological argument or the evidence from cause. By definition, it means that a necessary, so again, we're, we're using that same word that we used in the last argument, a necessary independent being is the first cause sufficient to produce the effect of the existence of everything else. So that sounds really complicated, so let me simplify it. It's basically the argument of cause and effect. And we're arguing that we can know God exists because he is the first cause of everything and all effects after that. Cause and effect, or the more technical definition which I gave you there. And sometimes, as I mentioned, it's called the cosmological argument. Okay. So, for example, uh, where does this come into play? Where do we see this, uh, you know, um, challenged in the world around us? Um, we see this questioned in a way um, in the question of what caused the universe, right? This is a big scientist want to know. The world wants to know what caused the universe. The popular answer is the Big Bang, right? There was a Big Bang billions and billions of years ago, and all of a sudden there was the universe, and, uh, but we need to probe further as Christians and ask the question, well, what caused the Big Bang? And it's, uh, it's unfortunate that not enough Christians take it to this next level, right? Scientists say, well, it's the Big Bang, and, and therefore we have, but oh, if we would just take it one step further, what caused the Big Bang, right? God spoke and the universe leapt into existence. That'd be a good answer, right? But... But this is, kind of, this is kind of what this argument does for us. Um, or we might, you know, another example, uh, what caused life on earth? Popular answer these days is evolution, right? Uh, the temperatures on the earth were just right, and there was some primordial ooze, and out of that ooze came, uh, you know, um, you know single-celled organism that, that uh, you know, somehow morphed into a multiple-celled organism that somehow morphed into a fish. That fish morphed into a, a dolphin, and then eventually that dolphin climbed out of the ocean onto the land, and now we have land animals, which eventually became humans, right? I mean, that's um, it in a nutshell, right? That's all you need to know about evolution. Okay, but if we were wise Christians, wise apologists, we would ask the question further, well, okay, I'll give you that, but what caused evolution then? 
What was the first cause? Now, I in no way, here's my disclaimer right here, right? I am no way a proponent of evolution, nor am I a proponent of theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is basically evolution that says that God caused it. And, uh, and that's just the worst, you know, that's just the worst, uh, that's even worse than evolution, right? Um, so, those are a couple of examples where this would apply. Okay, so let's get into it a little bit further. The argument of Thomas Aquinas, again, the most brilliant guy who probably ever lived, he argued this way, that empirical, right? We talked about empirical earlier. Empirical means evidence. So the empirical data, the evidence, shows the universe and the world to be changing, that it's in motion. The word he used is that it is moving, right? But it's this whole idea that things are changing, right? We look at the evidence around us. The world is changing. It is moving. So he argued further, if something is in the process of changing or moving to another state, and I don't mean geographically, I'm talking, um, you know, state of being in a sense, it is potentially in that state, but not actually in that state. So he argues, the beginning of his argument is this argument of actual versus potential. And furthermore, he goes on to say, it is impossible for something to be in a state of actuality and also in a state of potentiality at the same time and in the same way. Here's what I mean by that. Here's an example illustration. Imagine water, right? Water that is in a state of liquid that will become a solid when I place it in the freezer. Presently, its actual state is that of liquid. Its potential state, if I were to put it in the freezer, is that it would become a solid. So we have actual versus potential. Now, if I were to literally do that, Take this jug of water that's a liquid and place it in the freezer. Now it is in the state of moving, going from a liquid to a solid, okay? And furthermore, we need to keep in mind, as, as Aquinas argued, that the water is not both a liquid and a solid at the same time. This is very important, right? It can't be, they can't be both at the same time and in the same way. Right? It breaks the law of non-contradiction. So, the point is this. Very simple point. I mean, he goes to very great depths to make the point, but the point is very simple. Actual versus potential shows movement. The liquid moving into its new state of being ice. Right? It shows movement. So, therefore, Aquinas takes that and he says whatever moves from a potential state to an actual state cannot move itself. Something had to move it. Therefore, if there is movement, Aquinas argues there must be a mover. And furthermore, this mover has to be the independent first cause producing the effect of all other movement. Now, there's, there's a lot more that needs to be said about that, and I cut out about five slides just because I knew we'd be short on time. But if you get that, you'll be doing well, okay? If you want to take it another step further, once you get that digested, uh, come see me because this is a great argument. It's very complicated, but it's a great argument, okay? So, back to our question, how can we know that God exists? Here's our answer. Because the world and the universe are changing or moving, to use Aquinas' language, from states of potential into states of actual, which suggests a divine mover who is the ultimate initial first cause of all other effects. Any thoughts on that one? Let's keep moving because we're short on time. We'll, we'll ask questions at the end maybe. The third one, and these get easier, okay? This one's easier, and the fourth one is probably one you already know. So, The third argument or piece of evidence is evidence from design, which is also called the teleological argument, another word that comes from the Greek language. Um, but we'll just keep it uh, at the level of design and this word design. Again, this is an old argument, probably going back to ancient Greece, most likely, um, you know, 
Scholars believe that Plato himself probably um, came up with this one, although Plato wasn't a Christian. Um, but therefore, it was further refined by Christian theologians and applied to um, the uh, monotheistic triune God, who is the one true God. But by definition, evidence from design is this, that the universe has design and that it has purpose, which points to a purposeful, intelligent designer whom we would say is God. So we talked about this a little bit already, I think. Peggy, you touched on it as we look at creation around us, that there's... William Paley um, made this famous... Um, or maybe not famous, but approachable, I think, um, with his famous illustration of the watchmaker. You may be familiar with this. So his illustration, his argument goes like this. If a man were walking in a field and his foot struck a stone, he may ask the question, how did that rock come to be there? Right? Just imagine you're walking along in a field and you, your foot kicks a stone and you might find yourself asking, well, how did that rock come to be there? Now that person, that man may respond, well, it's been there forever. And so therefore, it did not come to be there at all. It's just always been there. Right? That's, you know, that's, that would be a somewhat reasonable answer. It would be a wrong answer. But, but on the other hand, if that man found a watch and asked the same question, how did that watch come to be here? It would be difficult, in fact, impossible to answer that it had been there forever, that it just was. Why is that? Because in the watch, we see a clear purpose as well as a clear intentional design which fulfills that purpose. Right? There's little cogs and there's little hands on it, all for the purpose of being able to tell us what time of the day it is. And so what the argument is, is that therefore there must have been a designer who constructed it and planned its purpose, a watchmaker, okay? So if we apply that, as we look around us, nature gives evidence in a similar way of purpose and design, pointing to the reality that it must have a purposeful, intelligent designer, Right? Uh, life is structured. Even as fallen and sinful as it is, the world is structured. Right? The sun rises in the east and it sets in the west every day. Right? I mean, it's, there's a design to everything. And, uh, and we also recognize, um, you know, we may have a special insight into this as the church, but we understand that there is purpose in what is around us in this creation that has been designed. Right? And that purpose is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Um, the world doesn't know that, and so it's often asking the question, uh, what's the purpose of life? You know, we as the church, we have a special insight into this, you know. But, but at the same time, I think that um, if we were to use this argument with unbelievers, we could just simply say, well, look at the design of the world around us. Look at how consistent some things are. Look at how repetitive they are. Look at how ordered they are. And uh, this could not have happened uh, randomly. Uh, it has structure. It has organization. Therefore, we must understand that there is an intelligent designer behind it. So that's what that argument, the teleological argument says. How can we know that God exists? Because the witness of creation shows intentional purpose and structured design, which could not have happened accidentally, but rather instead intentionally by an intelligent designer. That is a very good argument. Um, some apologists say that that is the, the best one um, that, uh, that can probably be used effectively to unbelievers. But. Okay, so, fourth and final, we're almost there. The evidence of ethics or the moral argument. This one's short and sweet because you probably already know it, but it was uh, made famous in recent times by C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. Uh, I encourage you to get a copy and read it. I have a couple of them you can borrow. But by definition, it is this, the existence of an inner objective sense of morality and an obligation to ethical behavior, this shows the existence of a moral creator who is God, right? So there's the existence of an inner objective sense of morality within us, 
And not only that, but there's this sense of obligation to it. Um, so furthermore, maybe just maybe this is even simpler, um, it's the argument of right and wrong. There's a sense within us, at one level or another, that we, we know what right and wrong is. Now, whether we follow through on that is a whole other story. But for example, as Lewis says, when a promise is made to us and is then broken, we complain that a wrong has been committed. We recognize that breaking promises is wrong. On the other hand, when a person in need is helped, we rejoice that a right has been committed. And we understand and recognize clearly that that is right to help people out. Right? On the other hand, we recognize that it is wrong to break promises. And so C.S. Lewis argued that at one level or another, this sense, this inner sense of ethical obligation is universal to all people, though some people are more seriously seared in their conscience than others, right? Some people have a sense of right and wrong that is much clearer and more, um, more precise than others, right? But at the end of the day, Lewis argues everybody has this. All cultures have this. All societies have have this. Therefore, where did this universal sense of morality and the human obligation to it come from? Lewis says it came from a moral maker, the one who made us this way, to know the difference between right and wrong, to know morality, to know what ethics and ethical behavior is. Okay? So, again, back to our question, how can we know that God exists? Because of the human sense of morality and the obligation to ethical behavior, it therefore points to the reality of a moral God. So, in summary, in conclusion, in summary, how can we know God exists? So this is just a very simplified uh, uh, chart of what we just did. First of all, we can know God exists because of his being, which is independent. It is necessary. We could use the technical philosophical word. Secondly, we know God exists because of the necessity of a first cause, a cosmological argument. We can know thirdly that God exists because of design and the purpose of creation. And fourthly, we can know God exists because of the sense of obligation to morality. And in all of that, we haven't opened our Bible one time. But are these arguments reasonable and effective? Absolutely they are. They're not 100% perfect. There's people that will argue day and night against all four of those. But what we do, I think we do, we have to recognize, believer, unbeliever, that they are thoughtful and they are sufficiently reasonable answers to the question of God's existence. Are they perfect? No. Will they bring you to faith in Jesus Christ? No. Will they establish in a general way that God exists? Reasonably so. So, back to Gary's question. I think this does absolutely apply to the unbelieving world, but hopefully it will also encourage and strengthen your own personal faith in God. And uh, there's a lot thrown at you, so you probably need to chew on it a little bit. But um, any questions? The, the kids aren't up here yet, so we'll keep the room as long as we can. Any thoughts or questions? Anything needs to be explained further, maybe? Or um, does any of this excite you? Maybe we need to start there. Is this a good path for us? Uh, Bill.
sure, sure. And like I said, these, these arguments are probably not going to bring somebody to salvation in Christ. All this is doing is giving us a tool to be able to argue in the first place that God indeed does exist. And then we need to go further, right? So if God does exist, which God exists? Well, next week we're going to suggest that the God that exists is the monotheistic Trinitarian God. Okay, well, if that's the God who exists, then has he informed the world further about his existence? And this is where week three and four is going to come in, where we're going to say yes, through the special revelation of the Hebrew and Greek text. So this is all a progression that we're going through beginning tonight. But faith is absolutely necessary. Where does faith come from? For salvation to happen, where does Romans say faith comes from? Very, from hearing what? The Word of God, right? We also understand that it is salvation, as well as the gift of faith, is the work of regeneration by the Holy Spirit, right? What did Jesus say in John 3, 3? Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So we would argue theologically that that's where it begins, the salvation begins with the Holy Spirit of God who removes the blinders from our eyes that when we hear the word of God taught and preached, all of a sudden it becomes translated into this gift of faith whereby faith actuated becomes salvation. So all we're arguing for this evening is that God exists. There's a lot more that needs to be argued to get somebody to faith and salvation. Sure. Right. Uh huh. Mm hmm. And I would argue that, you know, we're out of time. We got to get out of here. Um, one of my, I don't even, I shouldn't even unpackage this, but I'll just say it just briefly and you can chew on it. And, one of my pet peeves is when I hear pastors preach about blind faith, blind faith in Christ. We don't have a blind faith. We have a faith that's based on evidence, right? Knowledge, justified, true belief. We don't just believe because, you know, I feel like believing. No, we believe because of something true, and that something true has been proven. It's been justified. There's evidence. Gary, and then we gotta, we really gotta go. I'm, my wife is gonna be so mad at me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So from, and that's a very good argument, once again, for the ontological aspect of it, right? I mean, if we're going to conceive of the greatest conceivable being and use language that talks about the greatest conceivable being, well, we can't talk about him as if he doesn't exist because we've already proven by the use of that word that he does indeed exist. So, he, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. God, uh, we just absolutely love you. God, and once again, I just want to pray specifically that as we launch into the realm of apologetics, that, Father, yes, we want to be equipped to be able to stand firm and defend the faith, but, God, we also want to be used by you and by your Holy Spirit to be evangelistic with it, to be able to use it to point um, those who are lost to saving faith and hope in Christ. So, Father, this is my heart. Father, I hope it's the heart of this church. God, we don't want to just be right for the sake of being right. But Father, rather, we want to be right so that we can draw people into your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I told you she'd be coming. <laughs>